In this video, I'll be taking a closer look at the town of Lonewood in chapter 1, 10 towns of Icewind Dale, Rime of the Frost Maiden. I'll be going over how we can prepare for and run the town so that it becomes as fun and enjoyable for both you and your players as possible. This means going into how we can run the very complex Elven Tomb, as well as how we can adjust the difficulty for various party levels. And I'll also be looking at how we can tie the Frost Druids in Lonewood to the Durga in Kerkonic. When I sat down to record this video, I initially had an introduction where I sat down and told you that this video would be a bit shorter because I was trying to cut down the length of these videos. Uh, and as you can see, uh, that didn't happen. This video is also longer than 20 minutes, uh, so I had to reshoot the introduction. Um, if you've been following along here, my name is Jay Valeur and uh, I've been producing a dozen of these videos so far and I've been sort of making them longer, each one, uh, and I wanted to know if that's uh, something you like or if you would perhaps prefer that they were a bit shorter. Um, if you could let me know in the comments below, any feedback you have on, on this video is uh, incredibly helpful as I'm still in the early stages of learning how to, uh, to make the best content for YouTube. But uh, I won't waste any more of your time. We have a whole video on Lonelywood and uh, Awakened Animals, Frost Roots, uh, other cool stuff that we need to get into. We'll start with the overview of Lonelywood, then go into making a prep list for actually preparing for Lonelywood, and then I'll add in some details about how I would run and uh, perhaps change some of the stuff that is in the town. All right, let's get into it. Lonelywood is a rather small and isolated town in the northwestern part of Tin Towns. It's relatively peaceful and friendly and comfortable, and it has about a hundred citizens, so one of the smaller towns. The speaker is Nimsy Hoddle, who is a halfling that likes to bake cookies and also opens her attic up to visitors since the town's inn has been closed. The town's militia consists of 50 tribal warriors and four veterans, making it a rather large fighting force for a town so small. The town sacrifices food to a rill, as described in the book, and it has rivalries with the other towns around Mad Elden as do they? So all of the towns around Madualdon really do not like each other, and Lonelywood is no exception. We get descriptions of uh, three locations in Lonelywood. There's the Happy Scrimshander, which is a small shop run by a retired assassin and elderly woman who sells tools uh, for doing scrimshander work, so that's uh, sort of this carving of fish bones that Ten Towns is particularly known for. There's also the Lucky Liar, which is a tavern run by a red wizard spy, so a spy beholden to the arch necromancer Sass Tam. And this is where the townsfolk go to uh, relax and also share rumors with one another. Lastly, we also have the Ramshackle, or just Ramshackle Inn, which is a now closed inn that the characters may be able to take over if they play their card right and have any interest in running an inn in. Lonelywood. Finally, we have the White Moose Quest, which is about a white moose that is going around attacking the loggers and the other people going around the woods near Lonelywood. This moose has been awakened by the Frostwood Ravison, who has taken up hold in an elven tomb in the woods. So what the characters need to do is go into the woods, find this elven tomb, kill the white moose and defeat Ravison to stop these attacks from occurring. This is a cool little adventure location that has a few riddles and mysteries going on, but it's also one of the more complex and difficult run to run locations in all of chapter one, so we will be going into particular detail with that one. So as we've done in previous videos, what I like to do next is go through the scenes that I would want to prepare if I know the characters are going to Lonelywood. As the characters arrive in town, I'll probably steer them towards the Happy Scream Shander and the Lucky Liar. At the Lucky Liar, they can get some rumors and information, and at the Happy Scrimshander, they can meet Iriskri, which I'll have a little uh, extra way we can tie her closer to the quest of finding the White Muse and the Frost Roots. The characters will also eventually find themselves at the Speaker's residence, so we'll also prepare a scene where they meet with the Speaker Nimsy Huddle, just like the book describes, where they can get the quest to go into the woods, find the White Muse, and so on. As for the quest itself, we'll of course need to prepare something for tracking the moose. There's some uh, random encounters in the book we can run if we want to, and also a whole scenario for how the characters find the tracks, follow them, and so on. When the characters arrive at the Elven Tomb, we'll also want to 
make a lot of preparation here because it is a really complex uh, location. It has riddles and uh, several areas inside the tomb that ties together. So I won't be decide, uh, dividing this neatly into different parts, but instead going through the whole thing, trying to give a summary and also uh, some adjustments I would maybe make to make it more likely that the characters can understand what's going on so and so that it becomes a bit easier for you to run. All right, so now that we know roughly the scenes that we're expecting the characters to encounter as they go to Lonelywood, it's time to add in some more details and uh, see how we can really flesh out these scenes and prepare ourselves to run them. As the characters arrive in town, there's probably not a lot going on. It's a small town, and if the characters arrive in the middle of the day, there'll be some people going about their business, and the characters can rather quickly get an overview of the town. So I'd point out the two locations we have something for. That'll be the Happy Screen Chander and the Lucky Liar, and then allow the characters to go where they choose. As for the Happy Screen Chander, there's not a whole lot in the book, but it sort of sparks my inspiration when we find out that the retired and quite old proprietor of the town is actually a retired assassin. So that's um, something that I feel that we can build upon and maybe tie together with this uh, frost druid plot that we have going around the elven tomb and Lonelywood. So in this version of the story, we have Vernus, the frost druid that is now dead inside the elven tomb, arrived to Lonelywood a few months ago after having already been to Bremen, Targos, and Termalane to try and convince the locals there to start making human sacrifices. She does the same in Lonelywood and the town is uh, hesitant but decides to hold a meeting where they'll discuss the Druid's proposal that making sacrifices to our will will help stave off this uh, eternal winter, put them in her good graces and uh, maybe help them survive. In the end, the townspeople decide to refuse the offer and Iriskri, this uh, proprietor of the Happy Screen Chander volunteers to go tell the Frost Druid who is waiting out in the woods. She goes into the woods with some gifts and that's the last the townsfolk hear of this Frost Druid who doesn't bother them again. Of course, Iriskri, being a retired assassin, realized that uh, the Frost Druid Vernus wouldn't stop making trouble even if they refused her, so she decided to just do what you do with those kind of problems and killed her. She buried or hid the corpse in the woods where Vernus' sister, Ravison, later found it. Ravison is the druid that is now in the elven tomb and who is exacting her vengeance for the murder of her sister upon the townspeople. If the characters speak to the locals about frost druids and maybe inquire about what has happened here, if that's something we have built up throughout the character's journey through Ten Towns, they will be told that the last person to see Vernus was yeah, Iriskri, who went into the woods to, to give her this uh, refusal and also some gifts to make amends. You can roleplay Risky as this kind elderly woman who can explain to the characters that, uh, well, yes, uh, she wasn't pleased with our decision, but um, I brought her one of my finest knives and I think this gift uh, managed to pierce even her uh, cold heart and, and, and she decided to accept our decision and uh, yes, uh, we, we haven't seen her since, so uh, yeah. If the characters confront Iriskri about killing the druid, perhaps they find some information in the tomb or speak with one of the druid's corpses to learn the truth. You can have Iriskri casually admit that, yeah, I killed her, but uh, who would expect so much trouble to come from, from just killing a, a single druid? I was just trying to help uh, or something like that. So um, that's one way we can sort of put a little spin on the situation and involve the NPCs in the town a bit more and uh, perhaps give the players a little laugh as they discover that this tiny elderly woman is in fact a cold-blooded assassin. Next up we have the Lucky Liar, this tavern run by a red wizard spy. Now this whole red wizard sass tam thing isn't something I'd dive too much into. There isn't a whole lot of other red wizard stuff in the book, so throwing in this plotline alongside all the other plotlines is probably going to confuse the players and maybe lead them astray instead of just keeping focus on the story at large. So skipping up, uh, around that, I'll also probably not go too wild with the rumors here, depending on where your characters are in, your, in their journey through chapter one, because Lonelywood is so secluded that they'll probably have to go through Termalane, Targos and whatnot anyway, so they can get the rumors there instead. If the characters ask about Frost Druids, you can have the locals refer to either Iriskri or Nimsy Hoddle, depending on whether or not you're going with the whole elderly assassin plotline that we just described. In any event, the characters should uh, soon be 
directed to Nimsy Huddle, either if they're looking for a place to stay, because that's uh, the town's in for now, or if they have questions about the white moves and the frost route, something they have heard rumors about, or if they just loiter around the tavern, you can have uh, the boy Scoop, um, the speaker's Nimsy Huddle's uh, son, come fetch the characters as it is described in the book. So that leads us to the getting the quest scene, and uh, I just uh, go with what's in the book. This is very well described. We have a whole scene where the characters are offered cookies, and that's pretty fun. Uh, so there's not a whole lot that I would change here. I think the premise for the quest is also good and logical, and the reward of uh, 100 gold or even 125 gold pieces is also a substantial reward that will probably get the characters motivated if they aren't already. All right, so finding the moose isn't exactly easy. The characters have to first succeed on a DC 50 survival check, which takes one hour to make before they find a set of tracks. Now these tracks only have a 1 in 6 chance to actually lead to the white muse, which the characters will only discover after they've spent 1d4 hours following it. Along the way they will have a 50% chance for each 3 hours they spend searching for the moose to run into a random encounter. Now that's a whole lot of uh, dice rolling and uh, math and stuff, but in essence this means that the characters will probably spend around 10 hours on average searching for the muse and will probably run into 2, 3, maybe even 4, 5 or 6 random encounters. Now I'm not a huge fan of this approach. First off, if you're really unlucky you can spend uh, half a session or even the whole session just rolling survival checks and finding the wrong tracks, running into a random encounter and so on, and this will take up all the session's time without being really interesting or exciting for the players, at least after the first one or two encounters. And that leads us to the second point, random encounters can be superfluous and kind of boring even under the, the best of circumstances. So if you have the characters running into multiple random encounters in a row, it can get really boring really quickly. And of course it's fine that there's a whole mechanic for finding the tomb and some consequences to not being very good at it, but in the end we're here to have fun, so there's no reason to drag things out. So what I suggest is that you structure things just a bit more so that it fits your group and, and your preferences. That could mean picking out one or two encounters that you think are the best encounters, the most fun ones. For me, that would probably be the Banshee and maybe the Fox and Hare, because these encounters have some relation to the story or at least an interesting premise that we can play with. And then you can run these encounters if the characters do run into random encounters. We can also improve on some of the random encounters or make up our own. For example, I think it's a bit of an oversight that we don't have an awakened animal in here somewhere because that would really help foreshadow the frost route and can also help steer the characters toward the elven tomb. So that could be making one of the bears or wolves an awakened uh, animal that can maybe uh, answer some of the party's questions or have a cool little discussion with them. You could also make up your own encounter with an awakened animal, such as a small bird sitting in a tree above the characters as they stroll through the woods, who says in a deep booming voice something like, um, hey, you there, w what are you looking for? And uh, no, up here, dummy, come on, up here, I'm up here. Uh, offering flippant uh, discussion or some rude remarks, but also being helpful enough to answer the party's questions if they ask about frost roots and the white moose and so on. Perhaps saying, uh, oh yeah, uh, the big white one, yeah, I know where that is, uh, follow me. And then flying uh, across uh, the woods towards the elven tomb, and the characters will of course have to scramble to desperately try and keep up. Uh, but even if they fail, they'll stumble upon the white moose's foot tracks along the way, and they can then be led to the elven tomb. You could even have this uh, bird, or whichever animal it is, reappear as the characters investigate the elven tomb, maybe offering some, again, very rude, but also helpful remarks if the characters are having trouble with the moon dial or the other riddles that are at the tomb. Whichever encounters you end up choosing, I suggest that you stick with two or three at most, and probably just one or two, so that if the characters uh, keep failing and keep rolling and keep running into random encounters, you can either run a random encounter that can steer them towards the tomb, such as the fox and hare, if they can speak to the animals, or this awakened animal we just described, or you can simply have the characters stumble upon the moose's tracks without actually having rolled a six on the dice, because in the end, we want to get on to the cool content, the fun stuff, and not have the characters fight wolves and bears for hours in the woods, because that's just not very fun for anyone. Next up, the characters arrive at the elven tomb. 
Now, I like the Elven Tomb, but it's also a very confusing, I think, uh, location that is uh, probably the most complex location in Chapter 1 because it has a lot of areas that are connected to one another, so you have to read some information here, some information there, and so on. So what I want to do now is that I'll sort of uh, try to give an overview of the entire location and go through some of the difficult or problematic areas that you may run into as you're running the Elven Tomb. The first thing we should notice is that locations E1 to E5 are all outside, while E6 to E9 are underground. So when the characters arrive at the Elven Tomb, they see a hill with a circular indentation in it. Here says a gnomon, and I had to look that up, but it's the part of a sundial, or moondial in this case, that casts the shadow. Alright, so east of this moondial is this row of statues, there's a gazebo with a brazier and a sarcophagus on the hill. To the west of the moondial is the actual elven tomb, which is dug into the hillside. This tomb can be entered through E2 or the hole in the wall in E6. Now the book also says that there's magic redirecting humanoids and other various creatures away from the tomb, but this magic doesn't work on the characters as they are following the moose's tracks. This magic is ended if all the elven statues are totally destroyed, but since this magic is inconsequential, the characters have no way to know it's there, and that destroying the statues will do anything, it's completely superfluous. So for now, I just forget about this uh, magical effect and the statues, and instead focus on the important stuff at the tomb. Something that is more important, but still not mandatory for the characters, is the sarcophagus in area E4, which holds a friendly elven mummy. This mummy can be freed if the characters notice that the sarcophagus lid holds engravings of a twig, pinecone, flame, feather, and a humanoid hand, and then go to the brazier in area E3 and put these items into the brazier and light it. The mummy can help the characters work the moon dial and fight the druid, but they don't necessarily need to find the mummy to complete the adventure. And that's good, because as written, they'll need to chop off a hand to actually get the brazier going. If you want to make it a bit easier for the characters, you can allow the ritual with the brazier to work if a character is brave enough to just stick their own hand in the fire while the other reagents are in there. Whether they take no damage or perhaps 1d6 fire damage when doing that is of course up to you. Alright, so now we get to the really important stuff, the moon dial in area E5. There's a long description of this in the book, but you basically have a circular area of stone with a crystal gnomon in the middle. Symbols around it depict faces of the moon, and when moonlight hits the gnomon, it casts this light on the corresponding symbol. If moonlight hits the half moon symbol, it opens the tombs in area E8 and E9, and if moonlight hits the full moon symbol, the magic mirror in E7 can be worked. Once the characters arrive by the moon dial, they may just choose to ignore it and slip through the hole in the wall and to E6 and kill the moose, which means that they sort of completed their quest. But to actually clear the tomb and kill the druid Ravison, they have to enter the tomb in E9, and they can only do so by waiting for the half moon to appear in the sky and light up the gnomon, or cast moonbeam on the half moon symbol themselves, or use a Nox build. So there's two issues with this scenario as far as I see it. First, if the characters don't have access to Nox or Moonbeam and there's a long way to a waxing or waning moon, they can't get to Ravison in E9. Secondly, the characters may not even know that they need to get to Ravison in E9, so they just kill the moose and leave. And while that's fine of course, the book even accounts for it, describing how Lonelywood will continue to suffer attacks by awakened animals if that happens, it does cheat the characters out of a lot of foreshadowing because that's what Ravison really provides if they have an encounter with her. As for the first issue, there's a few ways we can improve the characters' changes of opening the tomb. First off, if you haven't been tracking time too religiously, you can just decide that there will be a half moon in the sky that night, which the characters know, so they can just choose to wait until night for it. Second, we can also give the characters a tool to cast Moonbeam. This could be a simple amulet, ring or other magic item that we can leave with the mummy in E4 that lets the wearer cast Moonbeam a few times per day. Now I've created this lesser Moonblade using the item card generator. There will be both a link to the actual item card and the item card generator in the description below, but it could really be any magic item that can cast the spell Moonbeam. If the characters then free the mummy in E4, you can have uh, the mummy reverently hand over the sword to any character it's find worthy, or perhaps the mummy uses the sword itself to operate the moon dial, whichever you prefer. Of course, there's no guarantee that it'll find the mummy and free it, but it does improve the chances that they have a way to actually access the tomb. Second, there's the issue of not knowing that Ravison is even here. The first thing we can do about that is that we can allow any character that actively searches the area to find humanoid tracks all around the Elven Tomb, with the freshest tracks leading to E9. If you need to underscore further, you can also have the white moose angrily calling out stuff like uh, Mother, have you forsaken me towards the door to E9? Or Intruders, uh, daughter of the Frost Maiden, help us when it encounters the characters in battle. Just anything that lets the characters know that there's someone else in the tomb. 
Now, before we get to the big showdown with Ravison, there's also the mirror in E7. Now, it isn't at all imperative that your characters activate the mirror, so we don't need to help them too much with it. If they do activate it, however, we may want to change how it works. The inscription in E5 about the mirror in E7 says that a character can have seven questions answered, but a crystal ball, which the mirror is described as, it used to cast crying, not to answer questions, and it has no limitations on use. So if you want the inscription to make just a bit more sense, you can either have the mirror function like the spell commune, but with seven uses per day, or you can change the inscription in E5 to gaze upon your own face and find who you seek. Finally, we have Ravison in E9. This is of course the most important encounter and also where we get to do a lot of foreshadowing. Now I think you can run the encounter mostly as written, but this is a good place to tie the adventure storylines better together as we have discussed in previous videos. The idea here is that Frost Druids and the Duogar are allies, the Frost Druids help the Duogar kill a Chardalin, while the Duogar help the Frost Druids keep tab on the Arcane Brotherhood. We can clue the characters into this alliance by placing a small pile of Chardalin in area E9, or perhaps with animals in E6. If the characters ask their Awakened Shrub or one of the other Awakened animals about this Chardalin, they can learn that Ravison instructed her Awakened minions to gather the Chardalin for the Grey Ones, and that it was to be transported southward in a few days. This Chardalin is of course meant to go to the Duogar hideout near Kerkonik, which the characters may realize once they hear the description, or at least when they find the Duogar and go to Kerkonik on their own. In any event, it will sort of lead the characters south and also have them feeling that they're perhaps unraveling the whole story of the adventure a lot sooner than we would otherwise have them do so. If you also ran with the whole Iriskri killed Vernus uh, plotline that we described previously, you may also want to have awareness have a single uh, very thin stab wound in the chest near the heart which of course is where Iriskri stabbed her with a very sharp knife. Finally I also want to speak a bit about the difficulty of the encounters here. Now this is a bit of a difficult thing to actually balance because we have a lot of moving parts. First there's the random encounters where you can go from a simple non-combat encounter all the way up to a banshee. And of course what you need to do here is uh, think a bit about the character's level. So if you're coming in here fresh-faced at first level, maybe not throw a banshee at them. And if they're coming in at a third or fourth level, you may need the banshee to actually make this uh, whole scenario just a, a bit challenging. As for the encounters at the tomb, you may want to adjust depending on whether or not the characters awaken this mummy at E4. Because if they have the mummy on their side, then the other encounters in the tomb become a whole lot easier since the mummy is, of course, uh, rather strong. So what you can do here is that if the characters do awaken the mummy before heading into E6, you can have other awakened animals assist the white moose here. This could be just awakened bears or an awakened badger or an awakened uh, whichever you want. Just uh, insert a few extra animals here to sort of give it a, a bit more muscle to play around it. On the other hand, if the characters are first or second level and they don't have any extra help, you may want to actually reduce the moose a bit, take away its multi-attack, perhaps even half its hit point, depending on where your characters are level-wise. As for the actual encounter with the Frost Druid, a single Frost Druid on its own will go down pretty quickly, even to a low-level party, but it does have some spells that can be really dangerous for the party. In particular, Ice Storm can be very problematic and maybe even a total party kill if the character is only first or second level, so I would probably not use that if the characters are already in pretty rough shape or if they are at very low levels. If the characters are higher level, perhaps level 4, uh, and even if they have the help of the uh, of the mummy from E4, you may want to beef up Ravison a bit. You can do this again by giving her some awakened minions to help her, a bear or two, have her already have conjured some animals using her conjure animal spell. Alright, so that wraps up this video on running Lonelywood. As for where the characters will go next, uh, we, we of course can't know, but if you've been following along with the sort of sample structure that I've been laying out, it's quite likely that the character will begin to consider going southward unless they think they have finished business up in Bremen, Termalane or Targus. So this could be because they still haven't found the cold-hearted killer Sefikaltru and talked Karen because, as I've mentioned a few times in other videos, the scenario, scenario I've put out if the characters are following Sefikaltru is that the Karen went to Targus and then cut across the Dwarven Valley alongside the mountain guide from the mountain climb quest there, which means that the characters have been searching around the other towns in the northwestern part of Ten Towns without actually finding the caravan, and they can do so when they get back to Targus and discover that the mountain climber is missing and the Torx caravan went along with him towards probably Kerkonik. 
in any event that's the town that i'll pick up the next video in kerkonik and i'll probably try to get these out a bit quicker and maybe put a few of the towns down there together and i probably won't get into covering all of them because i just sort of want to move on with the story now and go a bit more into how we can structure the later parts of the book including how you can put chapter one and chapter two more closely together and how we can fit chapter three and four into everything and so on Alright, so that wraps up this video on Lonelywood. Uh, as always, if you want to follow along with what we do, like, subscribe, leave a comment, all that stuff really helps us. I love reading your comments about uh, how it's either helped you or perhaps what you've done in your game, so any questions you have about the stuff that I'm saying in these videos. It's just uh, super cool uh, engaging with the community and other DMs out there running Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. If you want to support what we do, you can also check out uh, Patreon at, uh, at patreon.com slash eventure. And you can uh, follow along with our content on eventuregames.com and so on. In the coming weeks, I'll also probably be doing some stuff on Candlekeep Mysteries. And I've also got some other video projects that I want to do that is more general. So uh, you don't have to be a Rhyme of Frost Mint DM to uh, follow along with this channel. We'll be doing a lot of D&D related stuff. So uh, yeah, without further ado... Let's uh, wrap this one up and I hope that I'll see you in the next video.